I'm, I'm tremendously grateful and happy that Catham has made space for this, this session. John Kane was a, was a wonderful economist and great human being, and I think it's terrific for me to be able to be to remember him um, in, in, this, in this scholarly context. Um, I'm actually not, despite Paul's, uh, despite, despite Paul's uh, suggestion to do so, I'm not going to recount any funny personal anecdotes or any, any of those things. Um, it should be clear that I respect John Cain as a scholar enormously, but I respect him even more as a human being. And beyond that, I, I don't think that I don't think that's what my job should be here. And I'm, I'm going to just do my best to fill in sort of what I what I see as being the core, in some sense, of John Cain's legacy uh, as uh, as an economist. Now, when approaching John Cain's research, when thinking about this problem of trying to understand and trying to make sense of it, you're immediately staggered by the incredibly large array of topics on which he worked, right? You know, he's there in education, he's there in transportation, he's there in sort of interesting things about the political economy of cities, he's there in suburbanization. It's very, very hard to think about an area of urban economics that John did not touch, and touch, in fact, in a masterful way, almost always when he did touch. I mean, you know, there are so many times when I find myself working on something, and then, you know, I go back and look at something that John wrote and say, you know, he really got it, you know, 40 <coughs> years before I did, and, you know, um, it's a, it really is, a, is amazing. But there's another sense in which it is possible to find a coherent center, which is not in any sense to minimize all the valuable things that he did by, by strain. But um, this, this actually gives the chart of John Cain's 10 most cited papers according to SSCI. Uh, recently. Now, this is not in any sense to suggest that a man's legacy is shaped by a citation of John Gave a great deal more than that. But it, it does suggest at least where the bulk of John's scholarly impact has come. And it does suggest when you read this, as opposed to just being, you know, torn aside by, by the, the dozens of different, different papers, it sort of makes it, makes it clear what the theme is, right? Five of these papers, and more than 50% of the sites, are directly on race. Right? They are directly on race, spatial mismatch, uh, housing markets and racial discrimination with, with, joint with uh, John Quigley, the ADR paper uh, with Quigley, Persky uh, and Cain on the, uh, Cain and Persky on the Gilded uh, Ghetto, and his spatial mismatch hypothesis 30 years later. This is more than, more than you know, one half of the citations on this, on this uh, page are, are directly about race. Um, I think, actually, the other thing that's remarkable about this list is the extent to which the non-racial papers ultimately served as the basis for John's understanding of race in the American city. So if we think about you know, the urban transportation book, it is clear that he used that, that he pushed John Meyer, at least in John's description of it, towards confronting the role of race in, in cities through the book. It is clear that he used his thinking, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a second later, it's clear that he used his thinking about suburbanization or about the connection between workplace location uh, and residential location as the basis for his thinking in the spatial mismatch hypothesis. Um, and it is also clear even today that I mean, I, I think I just won't talk about it, that much of John's you know, passion for education comes out of passion for the American minority experience and comes from comes for understanding this. So at least I see this as being the unifying theme. It's a fundamentally about race. And I think that's in part why John Cain is really the father of urban research on, on minorities and economics. And that is really what, what John Cain will always be remembered for, is this is his, this is his legacy. And I think it's also, it's hard to tell this, but I think it's also pretty clear that that's fundamentally where his heart was. That was really what he was, what he was most passionate about. So let me try to make a little bit of um, sense about this. Uh, John Quigley, I think, did, did a terrific job of setting, setting up John Cain before the spatial mismatch hypothesis, setting up what his major contributions are. I'll just do a slightly different spin uh, on this. The, the three big things, I think, that John Cain did before the spatial mismatch hypothesis were his work on workplace and residential location, it was starting his thesis and then sort of you know, pushed through in the urban transportation problem and agreed to which his transportation costs are important. If housing is flexible and workplaces are fixed, that people are going to move to places that are close to the workplaces, if, which naturally leads to the, to the corollary that if houses are fixed and uh, workplaces are, are movable, then you're going to move your workplace closer to where you live, or in some cases you may not work at all because <coughs> is too large. So that's certainly one, one big idea. And, and 
John Kubiak was exactly right to mention it. He was one of three people who was working on this in the late 50s and early, early 60s. The thing that John really was different uh, than Alonso and moved on was his focus on suburbanization. His focus on suburbanization, particularly of employment. Right? John King got the fact that we don't live in a monocentric world anymore. And he got it really before and in a bigger way than anybody else did. And history has only proven him more and more right. Okay? He clearly was totally on point on this, totally focused on this. And, you know, 40 years later, when 75% of employment in American cities lies more than three miles away from the, from the CBD, from the core of the, of the city, you know, it's very clear that the sort of monocentric model does less and less justice to any aspect of, of the city. Of course, it still remains around, but I think in part because it is so tractable and it is, it is so elegant. Um, so that's the second thing. The third thing, which John quickly did not mention, which also predates, um, predates this, is actually you know, one of John's foremost cited papers, his paper with, in fact, John Quigley, uh, in uh, JASA on measuring the value of housing quality, which is an absolute benchmark in housing price economics, right? It is a paper that, that combines the use of individual level data, neighborhood level characteristics, and house level characteristics in a way that was, you know, setting, setting the standard at that point in time, and today still looks remarkably close towards, you know, blue chip economics, whatever they're run. Right? I mean, this is, this is still remarkably close to this. And it was really a, a quantum leap forward and, and appropriately enormously cited. So John has these sort of three big things. He has a lot of other things that he did. But what's remarkable is they all come together to form the basis of John's research on race. Right? So he takes these things, and a different economist could have gone a different way. You could have taken the JASA article and said, you know, I'm going to be about some other technical aspect in terms of estimating housing you done. No, he uses it to try and figure out whether or not African Americans or whites pay more for equivalent housing in the city. It's, you could have focused on suburbanization in any number of topics, but he focuses specifically on this issue of the spatial, the spatial mismatch. Now, might as well leave this up. I should try and put the race up in a little bit of historical perspective. Before John Cain, study on, on race in cities was in fact quite considerable, but it was not handled by economists. Right? There's a large sociological literature, certainly going back to the boys, of uh, including, you know, the boys himself, Kate and Drake, Tower and Tower, Kenneth Clark, a number of things in history and sociology that dealt with it. But the economics literature is tiny. Okay, in fact, if you do a general lit, general JSTOR search on white economists who were writing about race in the 50s, by and large, it's about unions. By and large, the bulk of the papers, there ain't many, are about various aspects of discrimination in the union movement. There are, is, you know, a literature that's connected to Gary Becker's uh, in 1957, um, but even that is still relatively small in the early years. Um, so race is really not a huge part of economics at all, and in particular, it's sort of in general avoided, one gets the sense, because of this general economics decision to avoid the soft stuff, right, that we're not about these sort of sociological topics, or hardcore guys who are about, you know, doing measurable stuff that really, you know, really important financial markets. Um, and you know, there's a sense in which John Cain should be understood as being as opening up this topic and as making the study of race in cities, making the study of segregation legitimate for mainstream economists. Uh, I think actually it's important for understanding the spatial mismatch hypothesis to understand that this is one of the things that he did, and that, that actually that wasn't an easy thing to do. So let's just remember what exactly the spatial mismatch hypothesis said. So let's just remember the um, the, the basic ingredients. Housing choices are constrained by discrimination. Okay, and that's the bulk of the, the St. Louis research is focusing on this. Uh, that leads to segregation between people and jobs, that creates long commutes and underemployment, uh, and suburbanization is only making this worse. Right? These are these are sort of the four cores of, of this. Often the big message that people have taken away from this is that segregation is really bad. Okay, that that's sort of the big central message on this. What's really interesting about this is that by Focusing on the distance between people and jobs, he made it legitimate to study segregation for economists. The things that we now think are more central were the effects of segregation, the effects of neighborhood, effects for young kids growing up, the effects of schools deteriorating, the effects of low levels of police protection for kids on the street. All of these things would have been completely anathema to the economics establishment in 1967. Right? This was, these were not topics, they were economist topics. But you know, distance between people and jobs, that was economics. Right? So what John did, and I often got this since talking to him, that he knew exactly what he was doing. That he sort of focused on something that you know, economists could do, 
in order to lure them into sort of the broader study of, of race in the American city. Um, and you know, the, the, the history after this is, is uh, it's hard to argue with. In the literature, the literature has been vast. Um, some aspects of the spatial mismatch of hypothesis have been uh, confirmed over time. Some have, some have had a more mixed history. Um, if we go to the, the, four, the four key elements, the idea that housing co choices are constrained by discrimination. I think the bulk of the, I think the bulk of the literature has fairly said that certainly there has been tremendous discrimination against African Americans both in the past and today in various aspects of, of the housing market. I think that's uncontroversial. I think it is less clear that segregation is driven primarily by that relative to decentralized white racist tastes. My own take on the data is that in the 1950s, centralized racism was dominant, and in the 1980s and 1990s, decentralized white tastes are far dominant. That would be my own take on what this is. And I think by the changing prices, as we all know, sort of blue, the blue chip test that was you know, developed in part by, by Kenny Quigley, this notion of whether or not blacks or whites pay more for equivalent housing. You know, that in St. Louis, that in the 60s really did, or Keenan Myskowski's work on uh, the paper really does suggest that historically, African Americans were paying more for equivalent housing. I think it's hard to say the same thing today. I think it's very, very hard to look at the 2000 census or the 1990 census, at least for rental units, to think that, there, that this is actually going on. And in part, this, is, this can be seen in terms of the massive decline of housing costs within predominantly African American areas over the past 30, 40 years. Right? But that's actually, that's actually what's, what's going on, and that's sort of the, the history moving us along. The continuing discrimination against uh, African Americans in the home ownership market, in banks, certainly is also one part of the general history has been very kind to, to that. Most of the subsequent work is really, really buttress that, um, leading up to things like the, the Humda data in the, 19, in the 1990s. The, the second pillar of it that um, housing market discrimination is related to segregation between blacks and whites is uncontroversial. That it creates distance between people and jobs um, seems seems less seems less clear. I mean, even at the time, remember, in Canaan, 65 pointed out that segregation, housing market discrimination against blacks, actually reduced the average commute for blacks relative to whites. There's actually a direct sentence by by Kane and, and Meyer on this on this issue. So it's certainly true that some degree of some African Americans were had an increased distance. Uh, but it seems, by most by most measures, it's less clear that that's increased. Uh, that's increased the the, uh, the distance. The third pillar, which is that segregation, then leads to underemployment, then leads to problems among African Americans. That the data has just gotten stronger and stronger. That message, which I think is the big message of the spatial mismatch hypothesis, the past 35 years of data has been just you know, fairly resounding on this. We've got more and more things that look like exogenous variation, segregation, as we've got things like the movement to opportunity experiments. We've just gotten more and more data suggesting that John was absolutely right 35 years ago, and that space really matters, and it matters for a host of reasons. Um, and I think you know every paper that works on this, really every economist that works on this, owes John because John made it possible, and John uh, showed the way. Um, the fourth point, which is the general effect of suburbanization, is obviously correct, and you know it's just become more and more true over time. So I think sort of the general model has worn up extraordinarily well. Uh, you know, certain certain aspects of it, which I think were, you know, were absolutely necessary to get economists to work on this at the time. But those aspects were rhetorically so brilliant, and rhetorically so much a part of making this legitimate for economists. Those aspects have probably not held up as well. And I think my guess is John would have been just fine with that. But that would have been, you know, given given what uh, um, the um, so uh, you know, just to just to conclude on this. Um, John has a, a just a staggering intellectual impact on, on urban economics. Right? He he in some sense differs, he's the sort of unique one of the founding founding fathers of this discipline who is drivingly empirical, drivingly focused on data, but also drivingly focused on the problems of the poor in cities. But this is really one of those to sort of, you know, Alonso's work, the Booth's work. You know, they're wonderful, wonderful times, it's great work. But it doesn't have this sort of incredible focus and passion for the poorest Americans in cities. And I think it's that sort of combination of intellectual excellence and sort of passion for social justice that really makes John so special and so unique among, among the urban economies. So I think we should